It's no surprise the Lockheed design for the JSF inherits the Raptor's contours. Built around one common airframe, Lockheed's proposed fighter is modified for each service. Most visibly, the Navy model has a larger wing and tail for carrier landings. The exterior design of Lockheed's fighter holds few surprises. On the surface, it looks like the company doesn't want to gamble. It's on the inside for the Marines' vertical landing requirement that Lockheed's bet the farm. The company's gone with a daring new propulsion system known as a lift fan. The lift fan has been a engineering challenge because there has not been a lift fan built before. In the lift fan design, the engine sits in the usual fighter position in the tail. A drive shaft connects it to a large fan placed behind the pilot. To hover, engine exhaust is directed downward. But the fan is also engaged, taking in air from above the plane and blowing it out below. That creates two balanced sources of thrust, potentially a more powerful and stable arrangement than the Boeing solution. But to accomplish this feat, the drive shaft must be spun at an incredible rate. Think of taking the propulsion system in a Navy destroyer, shrinking that down into a smaller package, putting it into a jet fighter airplane. It's a technological challenge in the tradition of the Skunk Works. If successful, the lift fan will be revolutionary. But on the drawing boards, it doesn't blow away its critics. It's a very clever solution, but it's got gears and bearings and a lot of moving parts. And in an operational airplane, you've got to make sure they work 100% of the time. If you're a pilot hovering at 50 feet and one of those parts fails, it's going to spoil your day. Despite its complexity, the lift fan offers another benefit, invisible to the JSF sensors and test equipment, but plain to the naked eye, aesthetics. Both Boeing and Lockheed realize the entire competition and the largest military contract ever may come down to the JSF's final requirement, achieving the Harrier trick of landing vertically. Houdini once made a five-ton elephant disappear. Lockheed plans an even greater feat, to levitate over three times that weight. A 17-ton fighter using its radical new lift fan. The fate of the competition, perhaps even the fate of the company, rests on this untested system. All of their eggs are in this one basket. If they do lose, effectively, Lockheed Martin is a fighter uh, production entity in the United States, uh, that will come to an end. They have nothing else to keep their front doors open. Lockheed engineers install their lift fan system into the X-plane, hopefully transforming it into that hybrid of the skies, a vertically landing jet. While it remains unproven, the concept behind their unique lift fan system exudes engineering elegance. Two columns of air instead of one in the Harrier balance the plane's descent. One column is the engine exhaust directed downward. The other column is created by a lift fan connected to the engine by a drive shaft. The fan takes in air from above and blasts it out below. It's an ingenious system, but in practice, it requires a symphony of moving parts. Lockheed has chosen a very complex solution. If something goes mechanically, catastrophically wrong during the hover, you have very, very little time to get out. A former Royal Navy pilot with Harrier combat experience in the Falklands and Bosnia, Simon Hargraves will attempt the first hover in the Lockheed X-plane. He spent years in preparation. Still, there's no question, he's about to take a ride on the wild side.
nobody's ever tried to model a propulsion system that's quite as complex as this, is quite as integrated as this. So there may be some areas there where the airplane doesn't respond exactly as I'm expecting. The vertical landing tests will start over a hover pit, 10 feet deep and covered by a steel grate. The hover pit is designed to minimize the chance the engine will suck in its own hot exhaust. Hot gas ingestion is a familiar danger to Harrier pilots. If the exhaust used to float the plane somehow enters the engine's air intake, the engine will start to choke. What happens when you ingest hot gas, your thrust decays. Your thrust decays, you lose lift, you lose lift, you start descending at a rapid rate and can lead to a catastrophic accident. Venting the hot gases out the side of the hover pit provides some protection. This will go well. Here we go, 70%. Hargrave holds steady 20 feet in the air. At 35,000 pounds, it's the heaviest fighter ever to hover. <laughs> wow. The lift fan performs without incident and produces 1,500 pounds more thrust than predicted. That was great. That was incredible. Let's do that again. Incredible. After nearly two years of struggling to keep up with Boeing, the Lockheed team now has reason to display their usual abundance of self-confidence. We've never had a doubt in our minds at any point in this program that this is the right type of airplane and propulsion system, and we've felt very sorry for the competing team against us. <laughs> I never felt sorry for him. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> While the lift fan works, Lockheed still hasn't accomplished the tricky mid-air maneuver called conversion, going from level flight to vertical landing with its complicated dance of moving parts. The Lockheed plane now needs to prove it's ready for prime time by performing the critical transition from conventional flight to hover to landing vertically. We need to demonstrate that we can land on a solid surface, both to make sure we've got the performance and the flying qualities to do that, to make sure that we've dealt with ground effects, such as hot gas ingestion, uh, and to prove that we can land on a, a normal sort of surface without damage or significant erosion to the surface. OK, converting in three, two, one, now. At 1,000 feet, Simon Hargraves engages the lift fan and slows down. With air from the front and exhaust from the rear nozzle in balance, the Lockheed X-plane floats on nearly 40,000 pounds of thrust. This system avoids the problems of the Harrier and Boeing's direct lift. Cooler air from the lift fan creates an invisible barrier that prevents the engine from choking on its own hot gas. And coming down, right in the middle of the pad. Hover oh, stop isn't quite right. Let's keep it going down. After two minutes of hovering, Hargraves eases off the throttle and gently guides the X-plane down. Just beautiful. No problems at all. Well done, Simon. <laughs> oh, yeah. Good job. Simon. Good honor. Yeah, that was great. Easy. Great. Good job, Simon. It looked like you've been doing that for 20 years. It felt like it, yeah. <laughs> but just before it crosses the finish line, Lockheed plans a final dramatic display, a bid for the history books, and bait for the huge government contract. In a test flight Lockheed dubs Mission X, 
its fighter takes off in less than 500 feet, then goes supersonic and lands vertically. Since the Harrier is subsonic, the maneuver is a milestone in aviation history and a direct hit on Boeing's need to strip off parts for vertical landing and reinstall them for supersonic flight. But the Lockheed team pushes its luck too far. They attempt a vertical takeoff and transition to conventional flight. When the plane bobbles in the wind on liftoff, the mission is aborted. But the failure does nothing to dampen Lockheed's legendary mix of technical ingenuity and engineering arrogance. This company believes it has won the right to build the first fighter of the 21st century. One of the biggest deciding factors in this competition, in my opinion, was that Boeing never managed to make a vertical landing with the aircraft in complete configuration. They took the inlet cowl off, they took the landing gear doors off, Lockheed Martin made complete vertical landings with the aircraft in the same trim that it could go to supersonic speed in. The X-35, now officially designated the F-35, may become the most widely deployed fighter ever produced. That looks good. I think it's ironic that Lockheed, in 1943, in effect gave birth under the auspices of the Skunk Works to the Lockheed P-80, which was uh, the first successful operational jet fighter used by the U.S. military. And here it is almost 60 years later, and they are now the winner of uh, the JSF competition, which could result in potentially the last manned jet fighter. It's the, uh, the closing of a, of a major chapter in the history of uh, U.S. air power.